Welcome to the lesson on gathering research and using evidence from online sources. I'm Jennifer Furlong, communication and public speaking instructor. In this video, we'll focus on the types of evidence you should use in your speeches, when and how to cite sources, and how to assess the credibility of your online sources. There are basically three types of evidence you should look for when doing research on your speech topic. Ideally, you want to be able to include a variety of evidence to create a more balanced argument. Concrete examples are effective when there's a need to illustrate a point, but just because you can list a few instances doesn't mean you have a strong argument. In order to avoid any hasty generalizations, you should try to support your examples with statistics that show them to be generalizable. You can also support your argument with statistics that show trends or for comparisons or distribution patterns. A final type of evidence you should use in your speech is called a testimonial. A testimonial is a statement made by either an expert or a peer. For example, you might find an expert testimonial in an interview printed in an academic journal, or you could interview your roommate about their experience with your topic for a peer testimonial. Understanding how to integrate a variety of evidence into your speech is one thing. Understanding the importance of citing your sources is another, especially in a persuasive speech. Whether you're quoting an expert from an interview or you're paraphrasing difficult to understand research or using statistics, you want your audience to know they can trust that you've done proper research. Not to mention you should give credit where credit is due including any visual materials like pictures, charts, or graphs. And it's your ethical responsibility as a speaker to acknowledge the work that others have done to create the research you're using in your speech. It's not just a matter of avoiding plagiarism if you're in a speech class. If the audience is confident in the validity of the evidence you're presenting, it will only serve to strengthen your position on the matter. Now that you understand when you should cite your sources, let's look at some examples of how to cite your sources. Remember in speech writing, you're writing for listeners and not readers. So your citations are going to look and sound much different from a research paper. You should write in the citations so the audience has enough information to determine the credibility of your sources and be able to follow up to learn more information if they're interested. For example, you could say the name of the journalist that wrote the article you're citing, but unless they are well known, like Oprah or Dr. Phil, you should provide the author's background information as shown in this first example. But if you're using a source that's well known, you could get away with just citing the name of the journal or magazine as shown as in this example. The third example shows how to cite a source while establishing the author's credibility at the same time. And the final example shows how to effectively cite a website. But notice the citation explains a little bit about the website in order to establish its credibility. This goes back to the point that if it's not a well-known source like biography.com or history.com, then you need to explain to the audience why this is a reliable source. And you'll notice I got these examples from the College of DuPage Library's website which falls under a Creative Commons license. And that means I can share these examples as long as I give appropriate credit. More examples of how to write oral citations into a speech are available on their website. So far we've looked at when to cite sources and how to cite sources, but we haven't yet talked about determining the validity of your sources. One of the greatest things about living in our day and age of technology is the ease of access to knowledge. How many times have you heard someone say, just Google it? But just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. And just because it's on a meme doesn't mean it's true. Just because it's a .com or a .org doesn't mean it's trustworthy. So how can we reduce the likelihood of using a source that's not a valid one? There are three things you should look at when assessing the credibility of online sources, and that is authorship, sponsorship, and recency. Now let me clarify a couple of things. Looking at the author to see if they're credible is a great first step. 
but let's say you find an online source that's not attributed to a specific author. It could still be okay. After all, there are many websites, like the American Red Cross website, for example, that might publish reliable information on their website, but never attribute the article to a specific writer. In that case, the sponsoring organization, the American Red Cross, is what you would look at to determine the credibility of the information you're looking at. It's also important to look at recency or the date of the last time the website was updated or when the article was published. If the website you're looking to cite hasn't been updated in the past 10 years, it's probably safe to say that's not going to be a reliable source of information. Let's go to the next slide where we'll take a look at a website that landed a student in a lot of hot water. In this example, we're looking at how using authorship, sponsorship, and recency is a good way to assess the credibility of a website. So here's the background on this example. I had a student who did an informative speech on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and he did what most students do. He went to Google. Unfortunately for him, when you Google Dr. King's name, at least at that time, this website would consistently pop up in the top 10 results. And at first glance, one could make the mistake of assuming that because the website is a .org, it is a legitimate website. However, that is not the case here. Just from looking at the website, we can't determine the author's name, so we'll go to the next step and look at the sponsoring organization. Now, most websites would have an About Us link that you could click on to read more about the website and the organization, but there's not one on this website, and that's a red flag. Most websites also tend to have a Frequently Asked Questions link that could possibly provide some additional information about the website and the sponsoring organization, but there's not one on this website. That's another red flag. So how do we learn more about the sponsoring organization of this website? Well, most websites will have a webmaster or web host link at the very bottom of the page. So when we click on the link here, we'll see who was hosting the Martin Luther King Dot org website. Okay, we're here. After having clicked on the hosted by link at the bottom of the previous slide, we can now see who is hosting the martinlutherking.org website. And I'm going to give you a moment to let this sink in. If the little hairs on the back of your neck are raising, it's because you are correctly sensing that something is terribly wrong here. See the logo at the top left of the screen up here. Yeah, that says what you think it says. White pride, worldwide. The organization known as Stormfront, a white supremacist group, was hosting the martinlutherking.org website. So let me repeat that. A white supremacist group was hosting the martinlutherking.org website. So now that you understand who is hosting the website, ask yourself this question. Do you think there is any remote possibility that that website was objective and unbiased? Do you think there's any possibility that that website was accurate? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say no. You can imagine the surprise on the student's face when I showed him that the source he used was sponsored by a white supremacist group. And yes, his grade did suffer for it. And this brings me to the last point I want to make in this lesson about evidence and research. Quotes. Speakers love to include quotes in their speeches, and that's fine. But when was the last time you stopped to consider the accuracy of the quote you're looking at? Let's take a look at what you need to look for when determining whether or not you should trust that you're looking at an accurate quote. So if you think you found an amazing quote you'd like to use in your speech, stop and take a moment to see if it passes the test. First, can you find who the author is of the quote? If not, stop right there and don't use it. Second, if it does have an author, but you can't find out exactly where the quote was actually said, then you need to stop there and don't use it. Also, if you can't find when this person supposedly said the quote, 
then stop. Don't use it. These are all basic questions that you should be able to find the answers to if it's a legitimate quote. If not, then the credibility of the quote is in question and you should not use it. Well, that's it for evidence and research. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it helpful. If you would like some more information regarding other communication topics, please feel free to visit my website at www.communication247.com. You can also email me any questions or if you would like for me to do a lesson on a specific communication topic, uh, send your request to speechteach912 at gmail.com. If you're a current student, please remember, as always, to email me using your official school email um, and also email me at my official school email. And that information is available in the syllabus. And again, lessons are based on The Art of Public Speaking, the 12th edition by Dr. Stephen Lucas, which is available at bookstores everywhere as well as online. Thank you and have a great day.